Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Emmy um, of Printed Matter. Um, I used to say at Printed Matter, but <laughs> these days I say of Printed Matter while we're all working remotely. Um, I have the honor of introducing tonight's event. Um, tonight we are launching uh, Moira Davies publication, I Confess, uh, published by the great Dancing Foxes Press, to whom I'm thankful for ushering into existence such beautiful publications um, with Moira, um, from Burn the Diaries to Now I Confess. Um, tonight's event will be moderated by the artist and writer Pradeep Dalal, and will feature a discussion uh, between Moira Kaysan Sharp and Delhi Giroux. Um, we will be dropping links on the chat box as well as on YouTube um, for the audience to learn more about and purchase uh, tonight's featured publication. Um, in addition to I Confess, uh, publications by Pradeep and uh, Kaysan are available via Printed Matter as well as uh, an edition by Moira titled Three Frames that's comprised of three stills from the film I Confess on which the book is based. Um, some quick and necessary logistical notes is that members of the Zoom audience are all muted. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available to watch on Printed Matters YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow. Uh, we welcome your comments in the chat uh, section of both Zoom and YouTube. Um, questions will be read by myself uh, and relayed to the presenters after the conversation. So please drop your questions throughout and we'll do our best to address them or combined, uh, combine the similar questions. So without further ado, um, our moderator Pradeep Dalal is a Mumbai born artist and writer based in New York. His work has been shown at uh, Sala Dia San Antonio, the Elizabeth Foundation Project Space, um, here in New York, Calicoon Fine Arts, and Murray Guy. His photographs have been included in publications such as Blind Spot, Cabinet, Grey Room, and Rethinking Marxism. His gorgeous artist book, Bhopal MP from 2017, is available from Printed Matter and was excerpted in Chandigarh, is in India, and his essay, A Bifocal Frame of Reference, was published in Western Artists and India. Let's take it away, Pradeep. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emma, and welcome everyone. I wanted to thank Moira and Barbara and Karen uh, from Dancing Fox Expresses for inviting me. Um, I too was thinking that we have somehow adapted so completely to this online universe that I had to nudge myself to remember what it would be like if we were at Printed Matter for this gathering and a chance to kind of browse, discover new publications and meet friends, both inside and outside, spilling onto the street and walking to the subway and continuing conversations on the train. All of that's kind of not on the table. Uh, like many of you, I voted early yesterday in Washington Heights, uh, New York, and the super line, long line circling around the block, three lanes deep, including many elderly with walkers and canes waiting patiently for many hours in the rain, was intense, a reminder of the urgency and the fraught brittleness of this moment. I'm going to just begin right away. Uh, I Confess was published on the occasion of Moira Davies' exhibition, The Faithful, currently on view at the National Gallery of Canada, Ottawa, curated by Andrea Cunard, who is in the audience with us today. The book is designed by Berlin-based Santiago da Silva, uh, also in the audience and published by the museum and Dancing Foxes Press, uh, Press, which also published Moira's Leg of Essays, Hemlock Forest in 2017. We have about an hour and 10 minutes for the discussion between Moira, Dali Giroux, uh, Kesson Sharp and myself. Moira and uh, Dali will give short readings to get us started. And then hopefully once we are midway, maybe they will read an excerpt again. Uh, from Moira's book. Uh, <clears throat> we will have 20 minutes for the Q&A and I think Emma will walk us through that. I'm going to do a quick introduction of Moira, Dali and Kaysen. So here is the briefest outline of Moira's bio and exhibitions. Moira was born in Toronto and studied at Concordia, UC San Diego and the Whitney Independent Study Program. 
recent solo shows include the ones at Gallery Book Halls in New York, Cologne, and Berlin, and at uh, Experimenter in Kolkata, Bergen Kunsthaus, Momok in Vienna, Camden Arts Center in London, Art Institute of Chicago, ICA Philly, Tate Liverpool, Kunsthalle Basel, Fogart Museum at Harvard, and Murray Guy, among others. Two shows opened just a few weeks ago, earlier this month. Uh, the Faithful at the National Gallery of Canada, which includes 54 photographs and six films, the highlight being Moira's new film, I Confess. And the show is open till January 3rd. There are some nice installation shots and walkthroughs and an interview with Moira on the museum website that gives us a sense of what we are missing by not being able to see the show. Uh, the second a monographic show titled Moira Devi Lanak Obras Works is at the Artium, the Basque Museum Center of Contemporary Art in Araba, Spain, and is open until March 7th, 2021. Uh, Dr. Dali Giroux uh, is a professor at the University of Ottawa School of Political Studies. Uh, her research focuses on contemporary pol political theory, indigenous political thought, subaltern studies, Quebec studies, and art and politics. She's published several books, and most recently, and you're going to have to forgive my English poor translation of that, it's titled The Eye of the Master, Figures of the Quebec Colonial Imagination. Uh, Dali is a subject of Moira's book and film, and she also contributed an essay, Correspondences, Notes on the Art of Moira Devi. I encourage you to also watch her lecture cited by Moria in the film and in the book, and it's titled uh, Repetition in Ruins, Notes in the Art of Radical Political Theorizing. It's available on YouTube. Uh, Kesson Sharp is a writer currently based in Toronto. His fiction and criticism has appeared in Canadian Art, C Magazine, and Guts Canadian Feminist Magazine, among others. His first collection of short stories, Our Lady of Perpetual Realness, was released in 2017. He's currently at work on a book of experimental criticism. He posts regularly in his newsletter titled, in this very cool way, I Know Right? Question mark. And also check out the podcast, Two Hungry Children, that he records and produces with uh, a friend of his, Kal uh, Kalale Dalton. The ones of the podcast that I heard had the most amazing reggae and hip hop playlist with Barrington Levy, The Wailing Wailers, Cardinal Official, Lauren Hill, and many more. Um, a new book by Moira Davy is a cele celebratory event. Many of us know her work and have seen it in exhibitions and through her beautiful and incisive books, from The Problem of Reading and the influential Long Life Cool White to Burn the Diaries. Uh, Hemlock Forest and the most recent index cards. And now this book that we are celebrating today, I confess. This project braids the lives and works of three writers, James Baldwin, uh, the Quebecois revolutionary Pierre Vallier, and the political philosopher Dali Giroux. Moira begins with Baldwin's 1962 novel, Another Country, and weaves in a personal chronicle of the 60s and 70s the turbulent period of Quebecois history marked by separatism and violence that remains unresolved today. Other characters also thread their way through, including lovely portraits of the horses Charlie, Cisco, and Goya. I'm hoping that this dense webbing of the personal and political in Moira's book, uh, film, and exhibition, I confess, will be illuminated a little in our conversation. Please join me in welcoming Moira, Dali, and Krishna. Moira, will you begin with? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Pradeep, for um, that wonderful introduction and uh, and for agreeing to do to do this in the first place. I was uh, so delighted that um, that you said yes, and uh, also a big thank you to Delhi and to Kason for. Um, for being willing to participate in the event. It's uh, really a huge thrill to be, with, um, to be with you. So I'm going to read uh, the chapter uh, or 
the segment or the fragment called uh, Pierre Valliere, and it's um, it comes after, um, as as Pradeep mentioned, uh, the first part is about uh, the the novel um, about James Baldwin's novel, and um, and then there's um, some yeah a discussion of another Quebecois writer, and then we come to Pierre Valliere. So I begin. In the wake of Raoul Peck's film, I Am Not Your Negro, many of us were reading Baldwin. I'd finished three of his books and was about to begin a fourth when I started to remember a political memoir from 1968 that I'd known about for decades but had never read called Negre Blanc d'Amérique by the Quebecois writer Pierre Vallière. The title, translated into English, makes use of the N-word, and Valliere was often called upon to justify his use of the offending word, but he stood by it. He believed the Quebecois were also les damnés de la terre, the wretched of the earth. Later, Valliere would embrace and champion the cause of First Nations peoples, the original colonized populations, of what would become a doubly colonized land. And here I'll just show you, there's photographs um, on every spread and they're all stills from, from I Confess. Um, my Montreal friends would often refer to themselves as a colonized people. And I knew from elementary school history of the pivotal defeat of the French on the Plains of Abraham in 1759. But my knowledge of politics stopped there with Benjamin West's giant arresting tableau of a dying man in a blood red tunic and a kneeling tattooed Delaware warrior. That famous neoclassical painting lives in the National Gallery in Ottawa, the city where I spent my teenage years. It is an iconic image signaling, signaling the start of centuries of colonization of the French by, the, by English Canadians in cahoots with the Roman Catholic Church and American business interests. So here you see the photos. Another strong memory from those years wandering around the nearly empty National Gallery, age 12 or 13, taking in Joyce Whelan's retrospective exhibition, True Patriot Love, with its signature quilt, Reason Over Passion, a repost to then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. I ordered Negre Blanc d'Amérique and read it and read most of it in non-chronological order, starting with the chapter on Valliere's childhood in Montreal lived under the iron-fisted yoke of medieval Catholicism and the corrupt regime of Quebec's premier, Maurice Duplessis, whose grip on power lasted decades. Pierre Valliere is a precocious kid who sees from the cardboard walls of his ghetto home, the extent of the church's hypocrisy and collusion with English Canada and American big business, a triumvirate that would conspire for centuries to keep the Quebecois docile and submissive. And there's the photo spread. Valliere reads history and philosophy and tries to rally his parents to his dawning conviction about the exploitation of Quebec's working class and farmers. His mother is pious and disparages her son's growing disaffection. She wants him to quit high school and get a job in a bank. Être un esclave en chemise blanche, je préfère crever de faim. Be a slave in a white shirt, I'd rather starve, he says. His father is more open, but ultimately too beaten down by the graveyard shift he's been working for decades at the rail yard. The writing in this chapter is sublime. Valliere is a tormented soul searching for answers to existential questions 
via philosophy, literature, and theology. Photographs. Reading the memoir, I'm reminded of many expressions I used to know. The great darkness, the white dust of winter, the quiet revolution. When I hear a strong Quebecois accent on the sidewalks of New York, I wince and I feel implicated. I went to school with French kids in Montreal and I squirmed alongside them in the incense choked church that adjoined the school and the presbytery. These buildings plus a fourth called Le, Man Le Manoir stood like chess pieces, king, queen, bishop, rook, on a rise that dominated the neighborhood. Even at a young age, I was embarrassed by my parents' faith and dreamt of going to a secular English school where I'd be spared the stigma of religion and the bullying that came with being part of a disliked Anglo minority. Catholicism scared the shit out of me as it did pretty much everyone in Quebec by design. Colonized oppressed populations usually have accents deemed inferior. Um, maybe it's hard to see, maybe it's not worth it. Um, I'm gonna sneak in one tiny last bit here because I think it, it kind of ties in Baldwin with Valière. So the section is titled James Baldwin, it's very short. James Baldwin was a child preacher. It was a way to evade the violence of the streets and a form of protection against an abusive father. Like Pierre Valliere, he embraced religion as a means to salvation, only to later recognize its hypocrisy and vehemently repudiate it. Baldwin once said, quote, I really mean there was no love in the church. It was a mask for hatred and self-hatred and despair, unquote. All right, so I'll stop there. Okay. Darling? Yes. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all today. It's, it's a treat, really, and, and especially you, Moira. I'm very, very <laughs> glad that we can meet again, although mm -hmm. remotely. Mm. Um, the excerpt I will read is from the translation of my piece in the book, the original is in French, and um, I will read uh, the first paragraphs where I'm trying to characterize the epistemology of, of Moira's heart. Um, <clears throat> correspondence is about connections connections between things, points of convergence, the vast and indeterminate class of things that relate, that relate together to something, to a form, to a theme, to a contact. The connections between things are sometimes intentional, as when two people correspond or they may emerge the result of coincidence or mimetism, whether conscious or unconscious. Throughout the history of living things, connections have been avidly sought, both for affective reasons and as a form of knowledge. It strikes me that Moira Davy seeks correspondences in her photo literary work, but subtly, the psychoanalytic layer never far beneath the surface. Correspondences, what might be called the art of making connections, operate in her multimedia work through resonance, through memory, through contiguity, a dodged an assuming inquiry into what is there, what there is. It's a matter of questioning, seducing, encouraging everything seen by a body in a place, a practice of vital resonance. 
for Moira Davy, Research and Life Interweave, a variant of the art of div divination that is art in its most archaic sense, forces, limits, affective structures, mirrorings, the self as a holographic fragment. I quote Moira, there's a narration and I became the delivery system for it, unquote. And onto electric tension sizzles and conjures phenomenological space and time. The surpassing of the photographic medium passes through Mara Davies' work via a surpassing of the medium through which the artist becomes medium. For it's not really autofiction, and it's certainly not exhibitionism. It's not quite Mara Davy either. It's more the trace of an intuitive experimentation with a form of knowledge that involves biting deep into the real, that requires unusual courage, and that maintains an extremely risky state of self-awareness, a form of knowledge that originates entirely with the living body on earth, defenseless, defenseless, innocent, faithful. Thank you. Kisan, do you want to comment or should I ask a question? <laughs> Uh, I can um, start us off. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for having me. And um, Mara, your work has been super inspirational to me. And so this is, uh, I, I promised myself I wouldn't uh, be too much of a fanboy, but I'm <laughs> um, One thing that struck me in both of the passages that you have read um, is the kind of circular nature of the work. Um, and how that circularity is really um, cross-temporal. And um, so there's work here from decades ago infused with new work um, and that kind of reaching across time creates these new resonances. Um, and I was struck how uh, you read Delier in non-chronological order um, and that really struck me um, mm -hmm. because the work is presented in non-chronological order as well. So there's something about like fudging with the chronology that seems to be important to how this com how we're framing this conversation. And, and I think there's like a political implication there too, because the kind of conversations that are taken up in this work in particular are these kind of circular and cross temporal conversations. So I don't know if you guys heard of this controversy with the University of Ottawa mm -hmm. professor um, mm -hmm. recently, um, for those who don't know, uh, University of Ottawa professor was using the N-word and, and it was justified or under like this idea of academic freedom and it was taken up um, by La Presse, by an opinion columnist in La Presse in Quebec. Um, and so it was interesting to have that controversy happen almost on the same day that I, Dancing Foxes sent me this book and I received it in the mail. Mm. Um, it was this uh, happenstance that was almost similar to your happenstance of coming across another country when you did. Um, and so I guess I don't have a, a solid question here, but I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts about the circularity of this work in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Dali, do you, do you want to start or how should we? Um... On the cir circular aspect? Um, sure. Um, the way I think of it is with the notion of repetition. Um, um, and we've talked about this with, with Pradeep in, in preparing this, this conversation. Uh, Moira explores or uses repetition in her work. Uh, I would even say it's a major theme or, or better, it's, it's, it's a device. Um, if you think of series like uh, the pennies or, or the empties or the newsstands uh, or even the, the writer in the subway, um, there's the, 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 this device of, of, of repeating 
and obviously the, the, the difference in repetition is always um, striking and moving and, and um, often imbued with a certain nostalgia. Uh, and we are delighted and comforted by, by the infinite variations of traces and alterations and, and marks and, and signs of wear uh, uh, that make which is repeated always, always singular. Um, and in my own exploration of language, uh, uh, studying political thought in, in all its forms, uh, be it ideas, discourses, writing, speech, newsreel, uh, uh, the social media constant secretion, uh, I give a lot of attention to this notion of, of repetition. repetition. And, and, and the way I see it is that most of the time, most of what we think or say or write, what is expressed is something that we actually repeat. Uh, uh, we, we hear and we read things and then we say them and we write them. The, the substance of thinking, of communicating, of, of building reality is repetition. And, and, and that is made truer by the fact that the texture of mass culture, its reality is, is the realm of the repeated mm -hmm. where, where everyday objects come, come in series, lifestyles come in series, ideas and politicians come in series and, and it creates sorts, sorts of an ontological loop. And I think Mora's work is, is kind of piercing this repetition, this ontological loop at the art, playing with space and time. Um, and, and, and I think Mora's art is, is a way to survive repetition and a way to make something out of it by by embracing what's what presents itself what present itself in its bare manifestation and and cultivating the magical quality of, of reality and the constant act of um, nurturing connections um, at, uh, I maybe I'd say something uh, later on about the the U Ottawa controversy, which uh, which I was in the middle of, as as you can imagine, working at at the university. I actually I actually didn't hear about that one. I heard about one at Concordia, a similar controversy. I didn't realize there was a second one at the University of Ottawa. Um, I'll just, um, you know, one of the ways that I came to, to Dali's work was through this incredible video called Repetition and Ruins. And um, I, uh, it's, it's a very, very performative work. It's, um, uh, she's in front of a, of, a, of a green board, a blackboard, but it's green and she has chalk and she has an eraser and she's talking about all of these ideas, many of them philosophical, um, many of them, you know, just very concrete about uh, how we have to pay to live. You know, we have to we pay to be born, we pay to get an education. We we have to constantly be be paying, paying, paying. You know, and paying to die, and um, and this idea that um, we don't. You know, we don't want to be producing value. We we want to we want to we want to live. We want to be living. And uh, um, but e even I have to say, even before any of the ideas really sunk in, because it's it's um, it's it's very heady stuff. What she's talking about, it was her affect that really um, uh, really spoke to me. It was her, her way of moving, her way of speaking, her way of thinking and speaking and these unbelievable diagrams that she draws on the board. They're, 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 they're so artful. I, um, I tried to reproduce some of them and some of them show up in the film and, and even in the book a little bit. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, then she just like erases the whole board and they're gone and, and she starts again. And they're, um, um, they're an incredible, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very, very um, engrossing performance. And uh, 
and it figures in in the film. I confess, it's I have it playing on on different on monitors, and you see her. Um, and uh, yeah, I encourage all of you to to watch it. It's um, it's it's really a fantastic piece. Moira, can I ask you a question just in terms of Dali's idea of repetition, like what is in the exhibition and what we've seen of the works are these large groupings, right? The 150 mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the and the dime, uh, the Lincoln uh, pennies, uh, 75 and the subway portrait. So there is spatially in the exhibitions, you are able to see that repetition from a very small unit. And the photographs themselves are relatively modest. Mm -hmm. But there is an accumulation of that density of thought that then mm -hmm. you see, and then visually you can sense the slight green of the copper, the brown, all of that. But in the book, how does the repetition work, or where is it coming? Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to just kind of sense, yeah, yeah, your understanding of when you produce the thing in the book, then what exactly is going on there? Like, how do you... Yeah, I mean, the book is, is actually quite a unique project. It's, um, it, it's, it's officially, it's a catalog for the, the survey show at the National Gallery and in Ottawa. But in fact, it's, um, I mean, it's a bit of both. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a bit catalog. And I think it's a lot artist book, actually. Mm. Um, and, and so it's really, um, it's really picking up on very new themes on projects that I, are very recent, you know, the film that, that I just completed. And, um, and then even these very, very recent black and white photographs of animals that I made of chickens and horses. And, you know, they, they, um, the, here you can see the chickens. So, I mean, this actually started when I was in Ottawa installing the show. I went to visit Dali in Quebec. She lives, you know, in La Peche, which is just not, not too far from Ottawa across the river. And I had this idea, I had um, this thought that I was going to make, I was going to make a portrait of her, but I, I, for, I was kind of uncomfortable with the idea. Delhi was kind of uncomfortable. So I, I ended up making kind of portraits of her chickens and her dog. And we went to visit her neighbor, John Eaton, who is a painter and has this magnificent Percheron workhorse named Goya. And I photographed him and I photographed Goya and um, and then there are other horses in here because as I was making these, as I was installing the show and making these, these animal portraits, I was also curating a Peter Hujar show for Buchholz in Berlin. And I was actively, consciously trying to channel his animal portraits, which are so, so incredible and so so I, there's photographs you know my kind of feeble attempts to do that um in these photographs of, of horses um so you know the book is every almost everything in this book is very very new and recent even though it also harks back to the past it harks back to well, in, in the case of, um, I confess to, to 1980, when I met Pierre Vallière and I photographed him and I had two or three rolls of, I had contact sheets, but I had only ever printed one photograph of some kids from, um, from those rolls of film, but I made all these, these portraits of him. And so I printed them for the first time and, um, but then I also had this idea that's, that's not very easy to articulate because it's a very intuitive idea. And it, it actually came from looking at Mark, you know, from, I've always been a huge fan of Mark Morris Rose 
photographs where he drew and painted in the margins of his photographs. So the idea kind of came from that. I wanted to put these little kind of gargoyle, you know, animals in, in the margins. And it was, I don't know, it was, it was a way of wanting to sort of bring the past and the present together somehow. Um, the past of these photographs and the past of my encounter with, with Pierre Vallière, with these, these little animals that I see as, as kind of, um, yeah, like gar gargoyle-like almost. Like this, here's sort of a good example if you, if you can see it. And, um, and you know, honestly, it's, it's this whole piece is kind of a form of magical thing. <laughs> And, but it's in, it's in the show, it's in the book. I think it's a, it's a bit of a risk, you know, to, uh, that I took, that, that we all, that we took to, you know, foreground this piece so um, prominently in the book, but I don't know, we'll see, time will tell. Um, and um, um, yeah, so, I don't even know where I started with all this, but with repetition and I guess with uniqueness, this is like, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not repeating the copperheads and the subway photographs. And I'm, I'm, you know, there's, um, there's more of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, try, I'm sort of trying something new with this book and, and it's, it's kind of what I hope to do with every book, you know, to have it be as new and fresh and risky as possible to, you know, to, um, to really, um, yeah, to kind of wager that with, with every book. And uh, um, I'm really, I'm really happy with it. Um, <laughs> And with, the, with what the designer Santiago de Silva did with it also, I think his, uh, he, he made many of the decisions in this book and I think they were absolutely brilliant. It was his idea to um, pull out stills from, I confess, from, from the film and to have them, you know, have the stills running through um, my essay so that it's, it's, um, it, it, you know, you kind of get a little bit of a sense of the film as you're reading the essay. So, yeah. Okay. But just quickly, there is an aspect of the film script, right? Like Dali's text in front yes. of transcription of the film. Yes, so it absolutely. is operating on all these different filmic registers yeah. as well. The stills from the film yeah. become the cover image transfers so that's yeah. kind of really interesting I feel there's testing and trying new ideas both technically formally you know with the overprinting that you had the release yeah. printing of the yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah yeah so in in the film I, I perform a narration and then I meet up with Delhi and we have a conversation and she talks uh, extemporaneously about Pierre Vallière and then we also have another discussion via Skype. And so all of, um, all of her words from those conversations are in the book, but they don't, um, they, they actually come after uh, my, my essay, my, my narration, which is quite short. Um, and and they're, they're paired up with the animal photographs, which, which I think is really lovely. Um, so there are, there are many voices and then there's Dali's essay and then there's Andrea Cunard's essay, which is, um, you know, very much about, about photography and um, antecedents in photography and um, these images that we pulled out of the collection, the archive of the National Gallery and are also in the show, uh, notably a Robert Frank photograph that Delhi speaks about in her lecture, Repetition right. and Ruins, and has an absolutely wonderful um, thought that she expresses about it. And we transcribe that and it's in the exhibition under the Robert Frank photograph. 
Uh, Kason, do you want to say anything about the artist book? Yeah, well, well, I think what I found so compelling about this object is like the book by its nature is a finite object, like it's complete, it's finished, um, but this one isn't in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I think like the, as we've spoken about the repetition and the circularity of the work lends itself to like an unresolved that it can be continued. So like it was interesting, it was an interesting experience reading and engaging with this book because I feel like it could continue. Oh, there's so mm. much, um, there's so much there to be continued to be explored. And I think it was one of the moments right at the end um, in Dali's essay when uh, she mentioned how you were talking about taking pictures of these horses and how you weren't quite sure what you were doing with it, but you felt compelled to do it. Um, and that kind of intuitive experimentation as Dali um, articulated it, I think it makes this book really uh feel alive it feels mm -hmm. like it, there's something there still growing mm -hmm. yeah wonderful can i ask both of you just to speak a little bit uh dali and kason about valier and the kind of understanding of valier and baldwin today in your context and if there is another kind of reading then we might have here uh, yes, um, Pierre Vallière's life and works, uh, well, it certainly has a, a, a have a historical relevance. Um, it's been associated with the Front de Libération du Québec, a militant um, underground organization of the 60s um, that uh, resorted to holdups uh, uh, and, and bombs and manifestos to fight against exploitation, dispossession, and, and the lack of political freedom of, of the French Canadian working class. And, and Vallier wrote his first and, and most famous uh, book while incarcerated in the tombs in New York where he fraternized with uh, Sto Stokely Carmichael and, and where he got to learn about the African-American uh, civil rights struggles, which he, he somewhat misappropriated uh, when he compared or equaled the French Canadian uh, economic exploitation uh, with the uh, black slavery in America. Uh, anyhow, the book was, was a central piece in the conviction of Vallière for, for murder and sedition in Canada, accusations for which he has been given a life uh, sentence. Um, politically, I think this is the past, but, but I'd like to say that, um, and, and it's something that I came to, to discover, rediscover with, with working with Moira, is that uh, Vallière has a literary and biographical uh, relevance today. Um, perhaps like uh, um, James Baldwin, whom uh, Moira associate him with, uh, uh, Vallière at a very young age has borrowed the essay memoir form of writing uh, to assess the reality of, of political, uh, racial, gendered, class violence in one's life and, and intimacy. Uh, he has this, or he had this kinesthetic resistance to, to the order of things, to the norms, uh, to <laughs> dominant society. Uh, um, he shows this pride and, and quest of the marginals. The, 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 he has this constant urge uh, to act and create uh, that so many of the writers uh, Moira convey in her work uh, as. And I think Vallière was, was beautifully uh, vulnerable, a, a tortured queer man who have had kind of a jagged trajectory. Uh, um, his mother never visited him in prison and, and I feel for him, I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I came to Valier kind of lopsided. Um, I'm from Toronto, uh, but moved to Montreal as a student and, and was studying his work um, and was kind of, I think the like the tension that 
Valier kind of catalyzed for me. Um, it wasn't directly about his work, but um, the idea of like that compare drawing that comparison between um, working class Quebecois subjugation and black slavery um, and meeting black people in Quebec and how that dimension um, kind of erases a history of blackness within Quebec um, and reconciling that as an Anglophone black person. Um, so like having discussions with black Quebecois people um, and realizing that there's this resonance between um, black Canadians like across the country in the way that um, our, the situation that black Canadians face is constantly compared to the States and, but is a different idea. And then like there's a different dimension to it. And um, just in terms of how like the transatlantic slave trade worked and how colonization worked and how migration patterns have worked. Um, and then black Quebecois people are like a specific subset within that. Um, so Valier's work was almost a point of connection for me with a lot of uh, black Quebecois people who I was meeting when I was there, who I felt a certain degree of alienation from, and I think felt a certain uh, resistance or alienation towards me as an Anglophone black person. Um, and so it's interesting how his, how his work has been taken up within black Canadian contexts in various ways. Um, has been really fascinating to me. Uh, Donnie, I quickly wanted to ask you that question that I mentioned to you once, that apart from the idea of the biography and uh, literary qualities, I'm also trying to ask, like Moira in the text on Valier mentions that episode where she writes about the idea. Uh, she says, uh, I thought it was a joke and started to laugh when he said they were serving hot dogs for supper. And he simply said in the English translation, we try to live as best as we can. That is perhaps modest and inconsequential, yet it stayed with me. So the place of a personal exchange, a telling detail, sharply observed and narrated unflinchingly, that this can help build some kind of connected tissue within the larger, more abstract uh, political forces. So just how is that negotiation between the personal, the individually experienced uh, situation, and then the larger frame? Uh -huh. the, the hot dog dancer. Uh, <laughs> this is a very fine inflection where, where the personal and the political intersect. Uh, the confession, Mora's confession, uh, uh, the shame, uh, uh, the mirrored shame of laughing at eating hot dogs and of eating hot dogs. Um, all this is the attention to the affective, affective scene that makes, that makes the hot dog a, a, a social class tensor where, where power relations outcrop at the surface of things. Uh, this is very much uh, Moira Davy to me, and this is why our photographic art cannot do without literature. I know it's it, it's it's a memory that 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 stayed with me, um, and and the exact you know his exact uh, response. Um, that wasn't so it's like 40 years I, I remember you know exactly what he said but I think I think it's another it's like one of these examples of you know like just like from from the particular to the universal or whatever like these these little details that um that kind of you know speak volley you know they just they have um they translate you know um, when it's like these, these, these very, very, um, particular details that people remember, they have, um, it's, it's the grain of truth, I think, that they contain that, that is what translates to, you know, a, a broader 
audience or readership or a viewership or, or whatever. Um, and you're so brave and you're a writer. Thank you. It was, um, it reminded me of this one other moment uh, when you were talking about um, your neighbor and um, Anne. Um, mm -hmm. And there's this one sentence, but um, Anne is mercurial, snobbish, and quick to judge and express anger. And I thought it was interesting. There's no um, comma there. So it could be read as quick to judge and express anger, but also um, quick to, like there's multiple readings in there. Um, quick to judge expressions of anger or quick to anger or quick to judge. Um, and I thought that was such a emblematic uh, reading of kind of Canadian relations in general. Mm -hmm. There's a, a quickness to judge, a quickness to express anger, but then also a quickness to judge our expressions of anger. And so it was like this personal moment that could be read in such a broader context, especially within the way that it's uh, framed in the book. Mm -hmm. I'll have to reread that sentence because I, um, I'm sure you're right. It, it didn't, um, it didn't occur to me that, that it could be, you know, that read, you know, understood in, in, um, in all these different ways. Um, yeah. Um, but no, I know the, the, the Canadian psyche is, is, really particular and i'm sure there is there is not just one canadian psyche but there are many and um i mean i it, i lived i lived in canada until i was 27 and i was part of the so-called art world and i i there was definitely a you know a, a, there was a psyche there that was um you know, very, uh, very, very particular. And um, I think everything that you just said could probably be applied to that, that milieu. Um, mm. Maura, I wanted to ask one thing, which was, you know, in the text that you read out, you speak of Baldwin's prose and then say that ever longer passages of pure gorgeous description and by an ever deepening complexity of the characters. And yet I was struck by how spare, precise and analytical the text is in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering that there's nothing extra in that, you know, so there's a kind mm -hmm. of, again, the weight of each of the paragraphs or the sections is kind of different from your previous books from Long Life or mm -hmm. Henlock. And then I was trying to understand if the gorgeous description you speak of in Baldwin's writing is actually in the images, you know, like the chromatic page edges of turquoise and carmine. So I just wondered if there is that kind of shifting mm. in the way that you navigate the two vocabularies. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true that my own text is, is really terse. It's very, very, it's quite short. And, but, um, I was delighted by every, you know, the object, you know, they were these um, little pocket books from the fifties that my partner Jason brought home and um, um, you know, yeah. And the page edges were tinted um, and, uh, but it was also, I was in a kind of, I was in a bit of a reading funk when these books appeared. I, I was, um, I'd been reading this book um, about, by this French writer, Emmanuel Carrère, about his conversion to Catholicism. God knows why it was recommended to me, but it was, it was really depressing me. And, um, and I really, um, I really need, I need books. Um, and th so these Baldwin books showed up at just the right moment. And it was just an incredible relief to be reading um, well, fiction, uh, as, as opposed to this nonfiction memoir and, um, and, but I had all kinds, honestly, I had all kinds of feelings about another country and I, and I, um, describe some of them, uh, and, you know, I, at first it was like, I, I totally welcomed this prose and I just dove into it and it was exactly what I needed to be reading. 
um, right then and there. But then, you know, there were certain things about it that start, start there, there's like, there's violence, there's violence towards women in it. And I started to have doubts about it, but it's interesting, you know, so I started to write about this, about, you know, the kind of back and forth um, that I had uh, in relation to reading him, um, embracing him and then kind of pulling back and then coming back to him once again and, and, and then kind of totally embracing him at that point. And, um, and that's when I started to write about him. But of course I had huge doubts about that. And I wrote to my friend, Alison in Paris and I sent her you know, some, some of what I'd been writing. And she said, and I said, I don't know if I can continue with this writing actually. And, and she said, she said this very interesting thing. She said, she said, I think any writer would be really, would be happy to know that someone was reading them and having this kind of, um, this whole thought process around, around their work, this, um, you know, coming in close and then taking distance and then, and then finally, um, you know, just, just diving in. And that's, that's what I thought I was going to be writing about Baldwin for, for this piece. And, but then I, you know, because I was thinking so much about decolonization, I began to think about Pierre Vallière's book and, and the, how colonization and decolonization are understood in Quebec and in Canada. And that was the rabbit hole that, you know, I just, I, I completely, I ended up in, in Quebec. And that's where I stayed for the whole of the piece. I come back to Baldwin a little bit. Um, yeah. I think we're nearing, I think our cutoff, maybe we have 10 minutes probably. Uh, so Dali uh, and Kaysen, are there questions or thoughts that you want to ask or? Dali, I know you wanted to read another piece with the Audrey Lord and James Baldwin exchange or um, whatever. Maybe I, I just want to quickly react to what Mara just said, saying Perfect. that yeah. if you think of colonization and decolonization in, in, in Canada, you end it, it's it's a rabbit hole where you end up in Quebec. And I, I and I think this is interesting because a lot happened in Quebec. A lot of of the of of the the struct the initial structure of colonization and 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 of the hurt and of of the people that were there and that are here now is happening in Quebec. I I think it, it's so, it's a lens or a prism or of something very charged in North America. And I think that there is still a lot of inquiring and, and work and art to do around that and, and to, to dive into uh, uh, Quebec history, not, not Quebec history as, as, as French Canadians people saw history, but, but as this constricted paradoxical place where, where, where so many current meets. Um, and, uh, I think what Mora did with, with I Confess and, and, and with the book and, and the exhibition is, is it feels like almost she, she's an oracle. I mean, she has this sense of putting her finger on things. She, 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 she's not sure what it is. She just, follow, she, she just follows uh, uh, forces and tracks and, and, and uh, delve into memory, but it, it's very uncanny that as, as we speak right now, I confess is playing in a loop in, 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 in a room in the National uh, Gallery while on the other side of the street at the University of Ottawa, we have this old uh, 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 raging uh, uh, debate and controversy around the use of the N word as, as a pedag pedagogical device in class. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of, um, um, 
almost a, a, a pre-science in, in, in Mora's intuitions and, and, and in her method, I think. I think her method as, as a way of knowing is very valid. And, and those correspondences I, I, I'm talking about are, 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 very, um, are very real. And, and, and as Kaysen said, it's, it's, it feels like it's living. It's, it's a living work because it's lived, because we're, in, we're all in there. We're all in the work, it, and 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 it, and it's going on. So it speaks to us in a very, uh, um, um, very live, very personal, and 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 very connected manner. And it's also the fiftieth anniversary of the October crisis. Right. Right. Which is, yeah. Another, the, the, this, the show was supposed to open in April and it, op it opened in October. Yeah. Right. Jason, anything to add? Or? Um, well, I think I was also just thinking about to kind of on Dolly's point as well, like James Baldwin is this uh, diasporic writer, like he's an he's known as being the expat American writer, kind of one of the quintessential ones. Um, and a lot of his work creates this cross-national resonance. Um, and I think what's interesting about this is about I Confess is that it does a similar thing where it is particularly located in a certain like national or regional context, but it also speaks to these like diasporic and migratory issues that are cross-national. And I think that like it's one of those cases of like content and form meeting where it's discussing these issues that are inherently diasporic in an inherently diasporic way. Terrific. I mean, that is a way of thinking I hadn't kind of understood. Um, uh, let me just see about that this. Um, Barbara says we can continue for another 10 minutes <laughs> because there aren't the questions haven't rolled in. But can I, for a quick second, I think, Dali, when you mentioned the idea of Moira's method and this pursuing down the rabbit hole, I wanted to kind of understand from Moira a little more about this intensity, the whole idea that she kind of redrew your diagrams to kind of get deeper into the thought process. Uh, so reading and writing is one part, but then there is the other part of like the Peter Hujar format frame idea, and then it's kind of worked. In the previous film, she recreates that shot from Chantal Lackerman. So I was just trying to kind of get a better handle on what that might mean, because the method is not something as straightforward as we may imagine it. I mean, that is a kind of an intensity of pursuit and then using everything in the arsenal mm -hmm. to get at it. Mm -hmm. The photographic, the filmic, uh, the reading, the pursuit of these language differences like you saw in the film. You know, these books are in French by Aki and, you know, the, uh, the French Canadian writers. So it's across languages. So that kind of fluidity of maneuvering and pursuit is something I was just trying to understand better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, y using everything in the arsenal, you say. <laughs> um, I'm trained as a political scientist and, and philosopher, which, which means that the tools and frames of reference I can use to explore or, or to contribute to knowledge, if I am to maintain some level of credibility, are, are, are narrowly defined. And, and, and I find that social sciences and, and more broader humanities are a quasi dried up source of orientation in the world because, because of kind of an instituted aversion to, to um, poetic operators and, and, and to um, authentic subjective experimentation. Um, and, and this is why I, I think that Mora's uh, uh, work in, in this world we are in, 
blocked up, uh, saturated with power and, and sucking upon crisis. Uh, um, this kind of art, as, as Mora defines it in her practice, is a high form of, of knowledge. It is subjective, it is empirical, it is an inquiry. It dares to bring into dialogues elements that don't belong together. It, it is writing and filming and photography and, and, and conversations and all of the arsenal. And it's about being right here, right now and, and carrying no prejudice, um, holding nothing. Um, and it's the gift of intelligence. And, and, and this is so because it's a gift, it, it comes as a gift. And, and I find that it's both art and knowledge and, and community making. And, and, and I think the, the carrying no prejudice part is, is extremely precious and, and rare and important. It, I confess it's an impossible movie to make. It's an impossible movie to make in the current state of collective thinking. Uh, and there you are, it's there. Um, and it is knowledge in a very, it's knowledge that you can know, have no use for. Um, it really is a gift of intelligence. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I channel, I, I channel you a lot in, in I Confess and, um, um, and, I, and I do it in all these different ways. I do it, you know, by, you know, being in conversation directly and I do it by trying to understand your, um, your lecture and by, you know, reproducing the diagrams and, um, making these montages in the film where I, I have the diagrams and I put photographs on top, you know, uh, on top. And um, so I kind of create these, these layers, but um, there's, there's definitely a, um, you know, a channeling going on, which is really part of my method. And I, you know, I try and be, I, 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 try and be as, um, I mean, I have to be respectful if, if that's my method. I have to like respect the person that I'm channeling, their, their uniqueness, their brilliance, their intelligence. And I have to find my own way through that and my own way of receiving that mm -hmm. and of interpreting it and, um, and, and making, you know, making these connections and, and correspondences and, um, um, br you know, bringing together disparate um, forms of, of knowledge and putting them in, in you know, in conversation. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's like you say, it's, tr it, it is tricky. It's, um, it's, it's definitely there. There are definite risks in, involved in in doing that. Yeah, and the part which I was kind of going back to Kason's first point is also being able to resist the idea to make those connections stick. You know, they're in play. They're mm -hmm. in the air. They're. Uh, there is the idea so that I think is also part of the method, or I don't know, but mm -hmm. maybe it is mm -hmm. part of a way of being where you don't tie them into neat arrangements. You know, they're left mm -hmm. to kind of rub against each other in different ways. So there's something yeah. around that aspect that I feel is interesting. One other quick question, which is just to go back to the idea, uh, uh, the term I confess and the idea of faith in the title of the show, like mm -hmm. how do we kind of understand that or decode it? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, just to be very, to be perfectly honest, the title was, um, it was suggested to me by my brilliant partner, Jason Simon. Um, we had both recently watched the, Hitch the Hitchcock film I confess, and um, 
which is this absolutely incredible film uh, um, starring Mont Montgomery Cliff as a priest accused of murder. Um, you know, there, there, so it was just like, it, it's all performed by, by, you know, everyone else, all the other actors are, are Quebecois. It's taking place in Quebec City in the 1950s, I think, you know, pr right around the era when I, I grew up in, in Quebec. Um, maybe it was a tiny bit earlier. Um, so it was just, yeah, I, I just, I stole, I stole the Hitchcock title, but um, it, it transpired afterwards that I, I, I had a lot to confess and it, you know, comes out in, in the film. Um, and, um, and there was just like one other, you know, kind of um, sort of, uh, kind of, yeah, co incredible coincidence, which was that, you know, so Montgomery Cliff is this priest unjustly accused of murder. And then we have Pierre Vallière, who was also tried and convicted of murder and fra totally framed. And, um, and later, um, you know, later freed, but, um, yeah, there there are a lot of there are a lot of coincidences like that in in the film, kind of uncanny, and um, and they all the parts just just kind of came together. It, it doesn't really have a proper ending, I have to say that I I, I really struggled with the ending. Uh, the ending is very um, it's a bit of a non-ending. Um, and, but I'm always ambivalent about endings. I never know if, um, if, I should try, if I should circle back, if I should do the classical ending, which I always find is a bit um, of a contrivance. It's not how things happen in life. Things don't have, have happen perfectly like that. You know, things like don't. Um, endings, you know, death is just like a cut, you know, as Pasolini, um, Pasolini said, it's, you know, this, this radical cut. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, just, I, I always, I, I have this um, indecision and ambivalence about, you know, should I wrap it up or should I just, you know, leave it and that's true truer to life to just kind of end it more abruptly and um not in a circular fashion you know which is a bit it was just denying the viewer something because it's it's inherently satisfying you know to have a narrative that completes itself that you know returns to the beginning and so it's i don't know maybe it's a bit sadistic <laughs> but i think there's something that, like there's a richness in mm -hmm. denying that uh satisfactory and like it it leaves an audience with something else maybe that is mm -hmm. perhaps like more important or richer than mm. a satisfying ending. Mm. Uh, just checking, are we to take questions now or should we just continue? Uh, Emmy? Oh. I think that we can probably uh, start opening it up. Um, uh, we have uh, one question from David Scriven, um, I guess uh, primarily addressed to Moira, um, but if anybody else would like to comment, um, if you've seen Robert Lepage's uh, La Confessionale, which mixes his story in with the filming of I Confess in Quebec City. I did see it. I didn't know about it. I think it was Dali, actually, who um, told me about it and loaned me the DVD. So. Yeah, I watched it after, pre pretty much after I had made the film or towards the end. Um, but um, um, I, um, 
yeah, I didn't, I, I think I might have known about it, but I hadn't seen it. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was really interesting to watch that film and, and, uh, and to see how, how he, how he handled it. Um, you know, what he, what he did with, with the Hitchcock and, uh, um, yeah. Um, and, and Pradeep, it looks like we do have um, another 10 minutes and I think, I think much of the audience has just been happy to um, do a lot of listening and, and learning from, from, from the presenters tonight. So I'd be very happy to turn the conversation back to, to you, um, if you'd like uh, to say some final words. Um, in sort of final words, I was just going to ask one question. Um, and maybe of both Kaysen and Dali and Moira. Is that okay? Or do you guys want to say something else? Yeah. So uh, Moira, in the book, uh, when you write to your friend, Alison Strayer, do you code switch when you speak French? Do you speak differently when you're in Quebec and in Paris? Can you say something, Dali and Kaysen and Moira, about the multilingual imagination, French and English, the social and political implications of language, I mean, in some way. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll start off. Um, I was, my French isn't amazing. Um, and so I probably have maybe like a seventh, eighth grade level. Um, so I read the text originally um, in French um, just to kind of feel my tongue around it. Um, and then went back and read the English translation. Um, and I think there's something specific about the Quebec experience within Canada that I confess, um, I think articulated really nicely is that there, that linguistic divide will always cause a little bit of, um, like you will never know fully the full complexity and nuance of it if you're not engaged with that dialect specifically. Um, and so I was really, I kind of pushed myself to read um, the French parts of this book um, because I felt it was, even though I didn't get all the nuances, I felt like it, there was something essential into just reading the words. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Agreed. Uh, language is not just a set of tools to communicate. It's not transparent. It's not clean. Uh, it has a thickness. It, it's full of dirt. It's of unspeakable matter. So it carries history, of course, but class, gender, race, uh, landscapes, territories, um, carries loss. Uh, and, and it would be too simple, uh, I agree with that, to just oppose the French and, and the English worlds to make sense of political history in Canada, or even to add in there the numerous and complex indigenous languages of, of which many are still spoken on the territory today. Um, so there, there are under the notion of language many realities, not, not only dialects and, and accents, uh, of course, there's that, but th it's also eras, continents, stories, maps, people, and 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 a more complex and and rich and paradoxical uh, vision of the Americas. So so yeah. Um, not only do I code switch when I am in Paris, but but within the same day. Uh, living my life in Quebec, I will use registers and indexes that are, that are quite different, different depending depending on the interlocutor. Uh, if it's my grandmother, if it's if it's a mechanic, if, if it's a room filled with art historians, or or some some guy my age living in the country, or a kid in Montreal, it's going to be different. So. And this, this is because the French language spoken in, in the Americas has, has, has been for the most part and for the longest time a oral thing. Uh, um, so it's, it's all variation of, of the media, medieval canuck patois Jack Kerouac uh, talks about. And, and as a consequence for most of, of native speakers uh, like me, uh, we deal with, with a significant uh, a diglossia 
where, for instance, the French I speak, a Creole of sort, is very, very distant from the French I write, which is normative. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is pretty uh, um, important in understanding the, the old, what I call the, sub the subaltern imaginary uh, of the French world and in the Americas. I actually, you know, that expression code switching, I came across it when I was reading, it was somebody who was commenting on, um, you know, what, what, what William Buckley, you know, when William Buckley attacked Baldwin and said he was, um, he had a, uh, a fake English accent or something like that in, in the 1965 debate at um, Cambridge. And so I was, I was reading a writer who was, who was talking about how, yeah, exactly what Debbie was saying, how Baldwin could, you know, could code switch. He could speak a certain way in Harlem and he could speak, you know, English a certain way in um, wherever in Europe. And, um, and he, you know, he did that with, you know, with a huge amount of ease. So that's that's actually where I um, I um, kind of learned that expression. And I and um, yeah, and I put it to my friend Allison, who learned French in Quebec, but then ended up moving to Paris and marrying a French guy. And um, and I was just, you know, really curious to know like how, if she, you know, if she spoke differently in Paris. I mean, I know she does. I know she, she lives with this guy and she's, you know, it's been 20 years or so. And, um, and so she, you know, she's picked up, you know, um, a French accent. But when she comes back to Quebec, she reverts to um, the Quebecois lilt as, as she calls it and speaks like the, the so-called mother tongue, I guess, is, is a way that you could, you could put it. Um, and she's also a very funny person and um, a really great mimic. And she makes fun of her Parisian husband. <laughs> she makes fun of his accent and it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> she exaggerates his French accent. All, all in, you know, in, in, um, in a very kind spirit. It's not mean spirited thing, but it's, um, and she does it a little bit in, in I Confess also. She sort of takes on the, the persona of the school teacher when um, she speaks at one point. Yes. I believe there's one more question. Uh, yeah, um, so we're we're coming to uh, to the end, and um, it's it's almost seven. So I think it's um, quite appropriate for the final question to go back to the to to the theme of circularity that was introduced by Kason. Um, uh, it's a question for Dali. Um, if theoretically there is no beginning or ending, what is the character to the extremes of the phases of repetition? And could they be arising from a lytic impulse? I don't understand the question. Um, <laughs> how would you how, how would you put it in other words? Or maybe you could read it again. I'll read it one more time. Okay. And perhaps the last bit. Um, and you know, it could you, you can interpret it in, in however you'd like to address. Um, what the characters of, of, of repetition could be for you um, if, if theoretically there is no beginning or ending. What is the character to the extremes of the phases of repetition? What is the character to the extremes of the phases of repetition? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't understand the question, sorry. <laughs> well, um, just, how do you understand it, Amy? I, I, I'm, I'm not quite understanding the, the question really uh, either. I'd have to think about it. I'd have to think about it. But Let's I guess, think about it, yeah. but, to, but to return to, to, return to an, open, an openness and no beginning uh -huh. um, uh, to maybe close right. to that closing, yes. um, 
and 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 you know feel free to jump in uh, Pradeep to to offer your closing words I just wanted to say that um you know like the book uh, we've gotten quite a lot of comments from people about just how powerful this conversation has been and like the book I don't think it's a conversation really meant to end um but at some point we stop um that that's it that's this idea <laughs> that it, it's it's for it's ongoing and we're yeah. all in there we're all in this conversation yes it's, it's going uh, through us and no beginning and no end means that we're all involved mm -hmm. um and, and for me what the book allows personally to 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 go into my eye um in the i confess um, is is a, a bridging of, of the, the, these histories of colonialism and, and power across our North American border from this very American insularity, perhaps you know not dissimilar in the way encountering the passages from from your shelf, Moira, in your great process of reading, you know, with that lack of prejudice, as Deli spoke of, um, an, an openness and positioning oneself in in that position of not knowing, right, while encountering these passages of Baldwin or Robert Frank's The Americans um, uh, from, the, from, the, from the perspective of being in, in Canada. Um, and, and that's kind of the power of books. So just on, on behalf of printed matter, um, uh, just go back to, to the book, Thank You Dancing Fox Express for that circularity too, of bringing it back to the book that doesn't have an end, a book that contains, but it's a book that contains an openness, um, that contains the questions. Um, thank you, Pradeep Dali, uh, especially Maura, uh, for your you work, Kathan, <laughs> and, and um, yeah, the work that allowed for this conversation, this, this convergences of, of excellent eyes. So, um, and, and, and I, I, I give the final word to you, Pradeep. Uh, no, I don't really have much, but I will say one thing, uh, Moira, that in the process of just preparing a little bit for today, by looking at all of the different book projects, I think there is something around the way that you have insisted on a particular way of constructing these books and the way the ideas and the images work in them. They're different. They're, you're improvising, you're changing, but yet when I look at them, as a group, I realized that I think for artists, it's amazing how, however, or wherever the idea is, it's the insistence on kind of driving it that then it becomes something. Anyway, so I was thinking about that mm -hmm. and I would encourage uh, everyone to kind of get your hands on the earlier books and just really pay attention because I feel that they are opening up a way of making and reading and thinking in a way that is not quite following any other path that I've seen. So, uh, it's my favorite way of working as an artist, frankly, making books. It's fantastic mm -hmm. <laughs> for all of us. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you Dali. Thank you, Kaysen. Thank you. Yes, Mara. thank you, Dali. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, Pretty. Thank you. Okay, bye. See you Please soon.